very good morning, uh, afternoon, and evening to everyone. A uh, very warm welcome to you wherever you are. Thank you so much for taking time off your busy schedules to, uh, to join us. My name is Lian Pin. I will be your moderator for our session today. Um, by way of a quick introduction, I am a professor of conservation at the National University of Singapore. Uh, I am also the director of the uh, Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at the university. Uh, in the wake of a changing climate is a four-part panel discussion series jointly organized by the Hit Foundation and our research center uh, in Singapore. Uh, this exciting new series uh, explores water, energy, and food nexus in the context of a warming climate. I should also quickly introduce our two organizations. The Hit Foundation was established in 2013 its goal is to help improve the lives of people in Asia by disseminating knowledge and sharing ideas, and by supporting and funding sustainable education and healthcare projects that develop social and human capital. The Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions was established in 2020. The center is a focal point for research, thought leadership, and education on nature-based solutions for climate change mitigation and adaptation. It produces uh, policy relevant science and builds capacity in the public, private and people sectors to help achieve a carbon neutral economy and stable global climate. Our session today is the fourth and final webinar of the series. It will focus on the food dimension of the water, energy and food nexus in the context of climate change, as well as conclude the entire series. The Global Food Security Index 2019 uh, Asia Pacific Region report showed significant disparity in food security across the region. Although Singapore ranked the highest in food security, much of the region is dominated by emerging economies that score below average uh, in the index. Climate change and COVID-19 have exacerbated the region's food insecurity. Some of the impacts of climate change related extreme weather events, including uh, more severe droughts and high intensity rainfall and floods that the region has already been experiencing have put food security and food accessibility at risk. Additionally, uh, COVID related lockdowns in society have disrupted the agricultural industry and interrupted food supply chains to different degrees, affecting the production and supply of staple foods. These food security challenges are deeply intertwined and interconnected with the other dimensions of the water, energy, and food nexus. Food production and agriculture in general are the largest consumers of fresh water. Modern food production techniques and technologies also consume large amounts of energy. In fact, the global food production and supply chains account for about 30%, one third of the total global energy demand. Therefore, disruptions to the global food systems will have ramifications across the water and energy sectors and vice versa. To help us fathom these wicked problems are three world leading scientists and thought leaders who graciously give us their precious time today. We have Professor David Lobel, Professor Harini Nagendra, and Dr. Stefan Halgaard. They will be speaking for about 15 minutes each and in that order. After their presentations, we will have a 15 minute discussion among the panelists which will then be followed by a 15 minute Q&A session with the audience. Now, before I introduce the first speaker, let me go through a few housekeeping matters. Your microphones will be muted throughout this session. As you listen to each presentation, I am sure you will have many questions for the speaker. Uh, please do enter your question into the Q&A box. Everyone in the audience will be able to see these questions and you are also able to vote for the questions you would most like the panel to address. 
then you can vote by clicking on the thumbs up button. We will prioritize the questions accordingly. We will wait until all three speakers have given their presentations before we start our discussion. Our first panelist today is Professor David Lobel, who is the Professor of Earth System Science and the Gloria Richard Cushell Director of the Center on Food Security and the Environment at Stanford University. Professor Lobel's research focuses on agriculture and food security. Specifically, he studies the underlying determinants of three aspects of food security, availability, access, and utilization, and how climate change might affect each. Professor Lobel served as lead author for the food chapter and core writing team member for the summary for policymakers of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, fifth assessment report. Professor Lobel, uh, the floor is yours. Great, thank you very much. It's uh, great to see so many people here and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Let me bring up my slides quickly. I'm going to uh, start us off by giving a bit of background on the food security and climate change issues in, in the region and how they're connected to each other. Um, and I'll start with something that Professor Cole mentioned, which is that the region itself has a lot of um, variation in food security. We measure that in lots of different ways, but a very common way that we look at food security is to look at childhood stunting, which it refers to essentially when children are short for their age, shorter than you would expect just from natural variation. And this map shows you the latest estimates of stunting around the world. And while you can see real hotspots of, of high prevalence of stunting in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, which often get a lot of attention, you can also see that Southeast Asia is almost unique in its, in its range of, of conditions uh, from very food secure countries like Singapore to fairly food insecure countries like Indonesia where over 30% of children are unhealthy in, in terms of uh, height. So there has been a lot of progress made in the region, but still it's, it's a major issue as I'm sure all of you are aware. You can look at other measures and, and in some ways they paint a very similar picture, but maybe even worse for um, Southeast Asia in the sense of wasting, for example, which refers to um, basically a weight for height measure, often showing um, as a sign of, of acute malnourishment. And this is less common than stunting throughout the world. But again, in Southeast Asia, it's among the most common conditions in the world, particularly um, in certain countries. So this is the sort of backdrop where we have to think about all of these issues of, of trying to understand both how climate change is going to affect these issues. And also what I'll spend some time is how, how these issues really directly relate to whether we can make progress on climate change or how quickly we can make that progress. So starting out with how climate change affects these issues of food security, there's a lot of different ways that these effects happen. And, and Professor Cole mentioned the IPCC report, which Stefan was also involved with. And, and you know, in some ways, the IPCC lays out as many possible pathways as possible and looks at the evidence for each one. But I'm going to try to just keep it simple here and talk very simply about the pathway of climate change affecting agriculture, and in particularly the ability of agriculture to produce outputs that we value, whether it's crops or animal products. Uh, and, and how that ability to produce those things then goes on to affect the, the food security of the population. There's been a lot of ways that, that this has been studied, um, a lot of different angles. I'm just going to show you one example. Um, again, this is just for to keep things simple, but also it, I think, is representative of a lot of what's been seen in pieces. And, and this is a recent study I was involved with that looked at, at the totality of what agriculture is producing. So not just rice or wheat, or not even just crop output, but all of the outputs from agriculture, including vegetables, including milk and, and meat products. And it looks at how our ability to produce that fluctuates over time and over space and how those fluctuations are associated with climate. And from that analysis, you can begin to ask questions like how much has the climate change that we've already experienced 
affected the productivity of agriculture. And that's what's shown here is, is sort of the end result of that study, both in, in map form on the right and as a, as a regional breakdown on the left. And what you can see is that already in many regions of the world, including Southeast Asia, we already see trends that are, are suppressing the growth of agriculture. In, in many cases, agriculture continues to be more productive than it ever was because technologies are improving, management is improving, but we can look at what climate change itself is doing and that's actually uh, can be thought of as a headwind for productivity. And these are not small effects to say that 20% of productivity has been lost in Southeast Asia as the result of climate changes that have already occurred uh, is, is significant and, and a similar number for, for the world as a whole. And there's, again, a lot of reasons why this is happening, but the fundamental one is that crops like humans, like animals, don't perform very well when the temperatures get very hot, especially when they're very hot and, and often very dry in some places or very humid. It can cause a lot of problems for all of these biological organisms. And there are adaptations, and we can talk more about the adaptations, but fundamentally, we see this relationship throughout the world uh, in rich countries and poor countries. And so this is just the the sort of crux of the story in terms of climate change, which is that it's a, it's a significant challenge to our ability to, to produce agricultural products, which then are, are the, are the uh, source, not only of the nutrition in many regions, but also of the, of the, of poverty reduction. Agriculture is a great engine of poverty reduction. So this is why folks like myself and scientists around the world are very concerned about climate changes because it does, um, in, in, in historical data show up very clearly in terms of its effects on what's already happening. Now, I think that is maybe fairly well publicized and well understood. What I think is becoming more apparent to people now is that the links in the other direction are equally important in that food security having a strong influence on how people use land and how people use land in turn having a strong influence on climate change. And especially as we look towards climate targets of trying to limit warming to two degrees or, or even less than two degrees above pre-industrial, agriculture becomes a really important part of, of the solution space for dealing with climate change. At the global scale, you can see this very simply as, as and this is just a nice uh, summary infographic of the world's greenhouse gas emissions, showing that although fossil fuels are the majority of it, and certainly in a, a critical part of the solution space, agriculture and forestry and land use itself is about one fifth of the overall emissions. And if you add in other aspects of the food system, things like moving food around or, or you know, driving boats to, to catch fish or driving tractors, producing fertilizer, those things, you can easily get up to about a quarter of greenhouse gas emissions coming from our, our efforts to produce food. In certain regions, it can be much larger. And in fact, in Southeast Asia, this is one of the regions where agriculture actually looms even larger as a, as a source of emissions. And the key reason for that, as I'm sure won't surprise any of you, is that there's a significant amount of land use change going on. If you look at land use change around the world, this is a breakdown of what drives that land use change. If you look at the, the activity that replaces the, the forest when, when that forest is cleared, you can see that if you look at the different categories, all but one of them really are associated with producing food. And you can also see that among the most common reasons that forests are cut down are for uh, oil seeds in, in Asia as a whole and in particularly in Indonesia. So the, the oil palm conversions, which have really important effects on, on development in the region and, and revenue generation are also having an outsized uh, effect on the climate picture. You can see beef, as you may have heard, is the primary driver of greenhouse gases in, in agriculture. It is both because the, the animals themselves produce methane, but also because of the land use change associated with the deforestation. Although that is not the predominant issue in, in Southeast Asia, it's more the, the oil seeds and, and to a lesser extent forest uh, products. So if you look at a country like Indonesia, for example, and you look at overall total emissions, you can just get a sense of how important land use is relative to all of the other things that in the US, for example, would loom much larger in terms of generating greenhouse gas emissions. Now, this is a, particularly the case in Indonesia and Malaysia, but if you look around, oh, sorry, let me just make one more point on Indonesia, which is uh, 
again, the, and, and it won't surprise anyone to know that a lot of this conversion is happening in the poorest parts, in the most food insecure parts of the region, that, that clearing land in particular for growing high revenue generating crops like oil palm is one of the surest ways in these regions to try to, to, try to crawl out of poverty. And, and we can see, for example, that there's a very clear connection between the, the level of village poverty and the overall clearing rate and, and much of that clearing is done through setting fires, which is something we can measure quite, quite easily. But even in a country, for example, like Vietnam, where land use change is actually not a major source of emissions, in Vietnam, actually, we see a slight reforestation over the last few decades. So there's actually a carbon sink associated with land use change. We still see agriculture looming very large in the greenhouse gas budget, second only to electricity and heat in, in driving the, the climate changing emissions from the, from the region. And this is predominantly in many countries, particularly in Southeast Asia, is predominantly associated with rice and the methane production that comes off of rice systems. And so efforts to, to um, again, by many of the poorest to, to meet their needs is, is inadvertently causing these emissions. So I think the main points I wanted to open with and, and to just make sure everyone is on the same page on is, is twofold. One is that climate change itself will be critical to reducing the, the incidence of hunger. We already see hunger being very persistent, particularly in, in regions like Southeast Asia. Climate change is only gonna make that, that harder, although many other trends are, are making the situation better. So it's not all, all bad news. But the, the second, I think, and maybe more subtle point or, or less intuitive point is that making rapid progress on hunger and poverty is in many ways the most critical strategy towards reducing the rate of climate change. Because without making progress on these issues, we're very unlikely to see uh, land use change slow down to the point where we can really feel like we have traction on, on climate change in the long term. And of course, fossil fuels, especially in more developed countries, are going to be key. But a lot of the emissions um, in many countries are fundamentally driven by people's desire to meet their basic needs. And so, so making progress on those in the, in the face of climate change is going to be uh, critical. So I'll leave it there, but I look forward to, to hearing the other panelists and, and getting into a discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Lavelle. Our second panelist is Professor Harini Nagendra who is the director of the Center for Climate Change and Sustainability at Azim Pranji University in India. Over the past 25 years, Professor Nagendra has been an ecologist who uses remote sensing or satellite remote sensing coupled with field studies of biodiversity, archival research, institute, institutional analysis and community interviews to conduct research examining conservation in forests and cities of South Asia from the perspective of landscape ecology and social justice. Notably, her book, Nature in the City, uh, examines the transformation of human nature interactions in Bangalore from the sixth century to the present, addressing the implications of such change for the urban sustainability of fast growing cities in the global South. It's a pleasure to have you with us, Professor Nagendra. Thank you so much, Professor Ko. It's a pleasure to be on this panel and I've really enjoyed the discussion so far. So I'm going to start and I will also end with this beautiful little sketch that an undergraduate student working with us, Rohit Rao, did of uh, a sustainable city from his perspective, which is also a city where food is available and where foraging is, is uh, possible in all parts of the city, from the sidewalks to the parks to the empty wild fringes of the city. Why cities? Because uh, we already are in a world by which is more than half urban. So more than 50% of the world's population already lives in cities. And by 2050, the expectation is that more than 75% of the world's people will live in cities. Of course, in uh, countries like Singapore, this is already the case. It's a very urbanized country. Uh, but there are many rural countries, for instance, especially in Africa, in South Asia, which are very, very rapidly expanding. And this is from the UN World Urbanization Prospects, where you can clearly see that all of the yellows and reds, which are largely cities in the global south, are the ones that are growing the fastest. Okay, uh, 
So how do we ensure food security in fast growing cities? That's the, uh, the question. And this is, uh, I'm going to talk about this with reference to my own work in Bangalore, but then bring it to a more global kind of a stage. And of course, these are fast growing cities of the global south, which are highly dense, where land is scarce. And so when you're talking about the water, food, energy nexus, how does one grow food in cities like this, where every square foot of land has a very high value? And if you can't grow food in the city, you then import the food from outside, which hugely adds to the energy footprint, the water footprint, and therefore the sustainability footprint. It is also true that if 75% of the world's population starts living in cities, who's going to be in the rural areas to produce the food? And of course, in countries like the US, for instance, you have a lot of mechanized agriculture. So people might not need to live in rural areas to produce food. Again, from a global south perspective with small fragmented land holdings, this is not possible, this is not feasible. So we need to understand a way of getting food security where land within cities can be used as multifunctionally as possible to produce food for carbon sequestration, for water uh, conservation, and for other kinds of benefits. And this is really possible only with multifunctional use. So let me start with a broader background. Why are people moving to cities in such large numbers? This is some research we did recently looking at a number of uh, 5,000 households, rural households across central India. And central India, some of the most climate vulnerable forests in different parts of the world. And uh, then in these places, we were looking at how and why do people migrate? And we find that the amount of migration, as you can see on the left side graph, the number of people migrating from these 5,000, from these villages uh, has increased significantly over time. So there's a lot more migration now to Indian cities. Some of it is seasonal, some of it is annual, but we are looking at seasonal short-term migration, which is distress oriented. And this has increased with temperature variability. As you can see on the right side of the graph, the black dot is the increase in temperature compared to the you know, the average temperature for the previous several decades. And overall climate variability, heat stress, water stress has been increasing significantly. So what we find is the poorer households are beginning to migrate much more across India. India's internal migration is in fact among the highest in the world. 30% of the population migrates from rural areas to cities. And this is, as I said, often seasonal, but mostly for work. And the migrant and informal sector workers constitute 92% of India's workforce. As you can see from this photograph, this kind of migrant uh, induced uh, formation of cities and temporary formation of cities makes it very difficult to feed urban populations because these are not people that are always in one place. They're going to be floating from one place to another, moving back to villages when they have uh, you know, time for agriculture and therefore, in pandemic induced lockdowns, we did see a high amount of food distress. Now ecosystems in cities we find support food security, especially if migrant workers like this in various ways. You might find it important for grazing, they do fishing, they use these areas for uh, drinking water, used for a wide variety of places. And so rural migrants to cities you find depend on urban nature in intimate ways in the heart of the city from grazing to livelihoods like washing clothes, you find that often old, older residents in the city might have had cattle, but they move out of these livelihoods and the new migrants who come and take over such livelihoods. But we do see that this becomes a problem then in cities because first of all, the environment in many cities, especially global south cities is fast degrading. Like I said, the pressure on land is huge. And so trees are being cut down, uh, wetlands are being filled in. There is new environmentalist movements which are stimulated by the awareness of climate change and water scarcity. This is a photograph from an environment protest against cutting trees. But these often lead to the kinds of environment restoration that are not food friendly. For instance, there's a lot of lake restoration in Bangalore driven by community movements. But many of these restored lakes do not allow these kinds of commons uses or local community uses. They don't allow the washing and watering of livestock. They don't allow grazing, they don't allow these um, kinds of uses like uh, dhobis who are commercial launderers, they don't allow women to forage for grains. And so you will also see signs put up in many of these restored parks that says plucking of flowers, damaging plants and trees are prohibited. And we were trying to therefore look at 
how what are the patterns of urban foraging in a city like bangalore bangalore is one of india's largest cities it's a uh, very well known across the world for its it sector so it's a globalized city if you talk to a policy maker a planner a local bangalore resident they will not say that there is any foraging going on in bangalore city but we did a household survey of 202 responders largely from middle income to low income families and we found that 16% of the respondents foraged for food 47% bought foraged species of plants and 42% would like to forage more and just these 202 res respondents we found 76 different species that were foraged and bought across the city right so it's not just food security that this provides this gives you local medicine it gives you nutrition supplements it gives you traditional knowledge these may not be the kinds they're not cereal grains they're not going to reduce your calorific needs but what we found for instance during the lockdown and the pandemics is that you might have had calorific sufficiency but people had a lot of food insecurity because they lacked access to other kinds of supplements apart from the calories the nutrition and element of it right so foraging is widespread in these places but what do you do to scale this up remember we said that 16% forage but 42% would like to forage and 47% actually buy forage species in the markets how can you scale this kind of things up so i'd like to give you two examples one is uh, an artist called suresh samuha in bangalore who has been working on reviving knowledge of wild grains he lives in a peri urban setting where he is working with village women he's from a local village originally to restore lakes to rewild these spaces to do urban foraging and he passes these on through a number of live sessions sharing of wild grains restoration of lakes for instance during the pandemic one uh, of of the many things he does a lot of different things this is a man with a lot of energy is uh, was to work with local women who lost domestic uh, help jobs during the pandemic during the lockdown and so what they were doing is foraging for wild greens and he started this venture by which people from the city could order a mixed bag of these wild greens which would be delivered so this urban foraging not only was a way for nutrition for people in the city but it also passed on recipes and knowledge to those people from um, backgrounds that had lost this connection to the land and it provided income for these women another community is forgotten greens which is very uh, successfully i mean it has a big following on instagram and uh, facebook it has a rewilding food festival which is held once a year they have workshops which they will train you online to go and look at the weeds around you and start picking up edible greens which you can cook with these are just two examples and there are many of these examples i'm sure you'll find them for instance across south and southeast asia uh but again how does one scale up is this something that is just for a very small population in these cities is it niche i'd argue that it's not we looked at a, a, a number of collaborators along with me looked at urban foraging across different cities and we were trying to look at the idea of how theoretically how do you uh, encourage urban foraging conceptually what are the kinds of ecosystem services they provide and in practice what does this mean for people we found that it's not just india for instance in bangalore i had said that only 16% actually forage in south african cities a number of different cities uh, if you look at uh, collated evidence 68% of people surveyed forage for their food and these are not like i said cereal grains but this is definitely wild greens and the like which are very important for food security 47% in cities like uganda and it's not just the global south also foraging tours many of them unauthorized are a regular feature now in several new york city parks in philadelphia surveys have shown that more than 75% of the foraging takes place in parks in the heart of the city of course in countries like stock in cities like stockholm mushroom foraging is very common and so is the harvesting of bean uh, berries people have now in place in cities like stockholm started working with migrants for instance uh, migrants from afghanistan who have gone there who have been foraging for mushrooms and picked the wrong mushrooms and been poisoned so these kinds of foraging have to be passed on to new migrants of different kinds that come into these cities but in cities like stockholm and berlin also different species are very important yet what our surveys found is just like the bangalore park that you saw which said no foraging no plucking of tree uh, plants etc most city authorities frame urban foraging as illegal or undesirable so what does this mean and i'm going back to this photograph that you can see nature is then in the city visualized as pure recreation 
And yet when you have such scarce land in a city, you must be multifunctional. So when you plant trees or restore wetlands, this must be done in a way that you also think of this as multifunctionally as possible so that you can create wild spaces where urban foraging is not just permitted, but encouraged. And this kind of traditional knowledge is passed on from community to community. So I end with this. How do we reimagine nature as part of a healthy city and therefore localize food, improve on the food, energy, water nexus, and really build on urban foraging? I think this is a movement that we need to scale up across the world. Finally, these are some books where you can get more information on this. And with that, I will stop and turn this over. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Professor Nagendra. Our third panelist is uh, Dr. Stefan Helgat, who is the lead economist of the climate change group at the World Bank. Uh, Dr. Helgat joined the World Bank in 2012 after 10 years of academic research. His research interests include the economics of natural disasters and risk management, uh, climate change adaptation, urban policy and economics, uh, climate change mitigation and green growth. He has also written about strategies regarding climate change adaptation and resilience and on a policy framework for a green economic recovery after COVID-19. He was a lead author of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, Fifth Assessment Report. Uh, Dr. Helgert, uh, please, uh, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And uh, so thank you very much for the uh, invitation. Uh, thanks also to uh, to Professor Narendra for the the presentation. I think it gives it gives a very good uh, context for for my presentation uh, and anchor uh, us into the, the the reality of the of the life of people living in poverty. So it's a very good introduction for me. I will talk mostly about uh, about modeling, but uh, I encourage you to keep in mind uh, what she was talking about uh, of uh, about uh, people trying to forage in in, in cities. Um, it's, uh, it's important to combine those uh, household surveys and information from the ground with, with the modeling results like the one we, uh, we, we present. What I want to talk about uh, today is the, the link between these issues of climate change and food security and extreme poverty. And I want to start uh, again with household surveys and the fact that when we talk about uh, poverty and we imagine uh, this uh, trend where we have fewer and fewer people living in extreme poverty. And of course, Asia is really leading the way with hundreds of millions of people uh, exiting poverty in the last decades. Uh, we should not forget that this process is not just a one way process. There is a lot of back and forth with people exiting poverty only to fall back into poverty a few years later. Uh, and they, in many countries, you find 30, 40, 50% of the population which will be in poverty at one point in time. So poverty is really not like a group, static group of people, uh, but it's a very dynamic process. And when we do household surveys and we ask people about the reasons why they fell back in poverty after exiting, uh, they mentioned three things. They mentioned the role of food prices and the shocks to agriculture production. They mentioned natural disasters drought, floods, and storms. And they mentioned disease, uh, malaria, diarrhea, and, and so on. And of course, those three reasons interact with each other. Uh, you can have a drought and it creates a spike in food price, and then you have health issues. But the point is, when you ask people the reasons why they fall in poverty, they name those three factors. And when you look at models, you find that those three factors will increase in frequency and intensity in many places. So here, my first point is really that climate change will not create new shocks, but things we know are bringing people into poverty will become more frequent and more intense. So we have very good reason to think that climate change will play a, a very negative role uh, in, in our uh, objective of, of eradicating uh, extreme poverty. So can we, try to imagine what it will do over the next decade. Um, how will climate change affect poverty in 2030? Uh, there is a lot of work on that. The point I want to make here is the impact of the same change in climate will be very different if you live in a slum 
in a city, like on the left and right of this picture, or if you live out of poverty in a very prosperous environment. And it means that if we want to talk about the impact of climate change on poverty, we have to look not only at the physical impact that climate change will create, we also need to look at how people live and all of the demographic, socioeconomic and technical trends that will happen between now and, and 2030. How do we do that? So the work that I present to you today is really starting with household surveys. So how does it work? We go in a country, let's say the Philippines, and we have a household survey which is interviewing, uh, so in the Philippines it's 40,000 households. So we have 40,000 households described uh, with their income, but also their demographic composition, how many elderly, how many kids, who works in what sector. And in the work we've been doing, we created scenarios of how this population might evolve between now and 2030 in response to demographic changes. Maybe people have fewer children, but also socioeconomic trends, like people become more educated, they will also change the sector in which they are working, maybe moving from agriculture to manufacturing or services. And because we don't really know what's going to happen between now and 2030, what we do is we try to look at the uncertainty with a lot of scenarios. So in all of the countries, we create 1,000 scenarios about how the population might change between now and 2030. And this shows how uncertain the future of poverty is in countries. Uh, at the global level, you know that we have about 650 million people living in extreme poverty today. Um, when we look at the possible futures, we have a very large range from staying about the same level to dropping to 150 million or even fewer than that. So this is my starting point. Many things can happen and it depends on the policies and the evolutions that we'll have between now and 2030. And now I'm adding to these trends climate change. And I'm not adding everything because I can't, but I'm adding five different impacts of climate change. One is the effect of food prices. Uh, and if food prices increase, of course, it will reduce the uh, available income for households. And keep in mind that it's very inequally shared because uh, while rich people might spend 20% of their budget in food, very poor people will spend 60 or 80% of their income in food. So if, if the price of food increases, it impacts poor people much more than, than, than the others. There is a second channel, which is also related to agriculture, which is a reduction in yields, uh, which David talked about earlier, which will impact farmers' income because they will have less to sell. Uh, but at the same time, we have to keep in mind that if they have less to sell, but the prices are higher, these two effects might compensate each other. There is a third channel that I will be looking at is the fact, as David also mentioned, that if it's very hot, we become less productive. And so for everybody working outside, and that's agriculture, but it's also construction work, and it's also a lot of the work taking place uh, outside or in places without air conditioning, um, productivity would decrease with, of course, an impact on, on wages, which is now very well documented. The fourth impact is through natural disasters, floods, cyclones, storm surges. Again, Asia comes to mind with a very high vulnerability to those, uh, to those um, events. And finally, there are impacts of climate change through health. Uh, of course, malaria and the fact that the, um, the, the places affected by malaria might change, but also all of the disease linked to water uh, and especially diarrhea for, for children, as well as, as, as child stunting. And here, I want to be very clear that this is far from comprehensive. Uh, we look a little bit at what we have data for, right? So keep in mind that uh, this is a very partial analysis, but we take five well-documented ways climate change will affect people. And we put that not in aggregates, but we look at what it could do to all of our households that we have in our uh, data set of, of, from household surveys. And we do that on all of the scenarios we have. And what we're doing is we're looking at how the distribution of income and consumption change and what it does for poverty. Now I will show you a few maps showing how the results look like 
globally. In some scenarios that we have selected, so those scenarios are basically the, uh, the, the scenarios where development between now and 2030 is not as fast as we would like it to be. So if you're a little bit pessimistic on the social economic trends, productivity growth and so on, and this is what you have for the number of people in poverty in 2030 because of climate change. So people who would have escaped poverty, but, but, but would not be able to. Um, and here you see Asia, of course, uh, very strongly. The total is up to 132 million people falling in poverty because of, of those channels. But here it's an absolute number. So of course, India shows up just because of the size of the population. If we look at the same map, when we look at percentage of the population, then the map changes a little bit, right? And, and Sub-Saharan Africa appears as the most vulnerable place in terms of the poverty impact of, of climate change. But South Asia is also uh, very strongly present, um, as well as, as East Asia with, for instance, the, uh, the Philippines. So what are the reasons? The main reason is the food price channel. And I should say that the scenarios we use for food prices are from IASA, and it's a, it's a research center in, um, in, uh, in Austria. Uh, so it's, it's, it's one model running, looking at different climate change scenarios. And, and food prices is the main driver in our simulations for the uh, impact on poverty. Uh, and it impacts mostly Sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia. And also very much in line with the pre previous presentation, the people most at, mostly affected are the urban poor, because they, they are the ones which are the most dependent on markets to, uh, to buy food. If you look at the impact through farmers' income, you have a different picture, because as I said, you might produce less and sell less, but farmers might benefit if food prices increase. So in a place like Latin America, you find this to balance. So for farmers, they are losing in terms of quantities, but they, they might benefit because of the price. And here, it's really Sub-Saharan Africa, which again, uh, appear as the most vulnerable, mostly because the impact on quantities produced are expected to, uh, to drop more than, than elsewhere. And so, again, in Asia especially, uh, the impact through prices seems to be much more important for poverty than the impact through the, the quantity being produced. What about health? Well, health appears to be a much more distributed uh, factor that affects basically all of the regions in the world. Uh, but of course, the regions with issues with providing improved water and sanitation to the population, including in South Asia, um, are affected very much through the waterborne disease and the diarrheal uh, disease. What is really important beyond those maps is to think about what we can do. Um, so here on the left, um, you see two scenarios, not in terms of climate change. Those are the same assumptions on how climate will change. The difference is only on the evolution of society and, and economies in terms of economic growth, but also access to energy, access to sanitation, access to improved water, access to air conditioning, access to healthcare. And what you see is my optimistic scenarios in terms of development policies and development outcomes can divide by two the number of people falling in poverty because of climate change uh, without changing the physical impacts, only because it makes the population less vulnerable. So I think it, it talks very much to one of the first points that David made, this interplay between poverty and vulnerability and the fact that the impact of climate change that we will experience are not written in stone. They depend very much on the, the policies and the actions that will be put in place. And reducing poverty is really the first priority because by taking people out of poverty, we're also taking them out of vulnerability to climate change. So the policies that we can flag looking at that are things like universal access to healthcare, universal access to improved water and sanitation, a coverage with social protection systems, and also improving the productivity of small farmers uh, and better share of the revenues between uh, landowners and people working in agriculture. Also 
demography and education for the population. And what I want to flag here is the fact that those policies that I'm listing here would not be considered climate change adaptation. They are not directly trying to reduce the impact of climate change, but by making good development, by making inclusive development, by providing people with ways of being more resilient, they can do the job of adaptation to climate change. So development, good development is really one of the most important tool that we have to reduce vulnerability and to adapt to, uh, to climate change. Of course, this is only looking at 2030. So a very moderate change in climate, and it doesn't replace action on emissions if you want to look at the longer term, but it really flags the importance of eradicating extreme poverty as fast as we can to protect people against climate change. My last point is um, we're in the middle of the COVID-19 crisis, and I think it's important to keep this figure in mind. Um, this is, you see in black, the decline in poverty that we had before COVID and the jump that we, um, we uh, see today because of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, we estimate that about 100 million people or 150 million people um, are falling in poverty because of, of, of COVID. Our projections for climate change are of the same orders of magnitude. So it gives you a sense of the importance of tackling COVID crisis and climate change adaptation at the same time, because those two things basically have the same magnitude and they both need to be tackled together. I won't go too much into the details. We have uh, a lot of details on those methodologies and the limits and, uh, and, and the results in, uh, in our papers, but I really look forward to the, to the discussion and to the question. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, uh, Dr. Halgert. That, that's a fascinating uh, presentation. Now, before we start our panel discussion, may I remind the audience that you can continue to key in your questions, of course, in the uh, Q&A box, and also to vote for your favorite questions by clicking on the thumbs up button. Uh, so the next segment is a 15 minute uh, discussion among the, the panelists. Um, I do have a few questions, but uh, uh, if, if any of the panelists have questions for for one another, please, please do uh, speak up. Uh, I think uh, we can keep this as informal as, as we, we, we want. Um, maybe maybe just to kickstart kick, kick start, uh, the discussion, I, I have a question for uh, Professor Lobel. So uh, David, you talked about the uh, impact of climate change on agricultural productivity across space and time. Um, so, so based on your studies, um, do you have any insights to share about how uh, how the how different nations or countries may need to work together to ensure our collective food security in the face of uh, climate change impacts on agriculture? Yeah, that's a great question. I think a lot of people tend to think about agriculture as a very local uh, process. I mean, it is each individual farm has its own challenges. Each individual country has its own climate, its own uh, traditions, its own practices. And so in, in many ways, people think of, of each country needing to focus on its own adaptations. And you'll often hear people say adaptation is local. Um, but the reality is in agriculture, almost all of the technologies that are being developed and used by farmers are tracing back towards in international cooperation and international um, investments, both in terms of seed development or in terms of just management practices. And you know, much of Southeast Asia, for example, are growing rice varieties that came out of the Philippines. And that, that center in the Philippines is supported by the World Bank, by all sorts of other um, organizations. And so, you know, Another good example is, and this is something that will be, I think, increasingly important with climate change is you not only need a good um, set of, of crops and, and practices by the farmers, but you need a good surveillance system, for example, to, to be able to un identify when new diseases or new pests are breaking out. And countries need to invest in the common resources to be able to do that. They need to invest in the genetic resources to be able to develop new varieties, but they also need to be very open with each other in terms of when they see new things emerging. Uh, and they need to be, you know, open and sharing different genetic resources so that they all have access. So I think time and again, people, 
underestimate how much historically this kind of global public good um, aspect of agriculture has been really critical. And it relates also to something Stefan said, which is that I think many people underappreciate how important low food prices are for poverty. And so it's not just the rural people that benefit from these technologies, but if you look historically in Asia, a lot of the poverty reduction has come because prices have been lowered by international investments in, in new farming technologies. So I think the, the premise of your question is, is absolutely right, which is that this is, this is a collective challenge, not only on the you know, mitigation of climate change, which everybody is familiar with how that is a collective action issue. It's I think equally important on the adaptation side. Maybe if I can add one point on that, which I, I think is also really important is what happens to the global food trade when there are shocks in productions. And very often we see a very uh, natural response, which are export bans or countries starting to uh, stock foods with the expectation that prices will increase over time. And those things can create the crisis to start with, even if the shock to supply would have been manageable if you start to see export bans and, and people storing food, you, you can get your increase in food prices even though you might not have needed it. And it's really difficult. You need a lot of coordination and a lot of trust of all of the players to decide not to play those, those tactics which are really centered on the domestic agenda uh, to minimize the impact at the global level and especially for the poorest and the most vulnerable or in places that are mostly importing food. So how do we create that, that trust and we avoid those bad reactions that are making everything worse is also a very important domain for international cooperation. And I'd like to add, uh, I think these are important points. And the additional thing is with climate change and the impacts on water security, we are seeing a lot of countries that are water poor buying up large tracts of land in poorer countries in the global south. For instance, many grazing lands in Africa that are being bought up by countries that are um, that think they're going to be running out of water soon in the next 20 years. So those kinds of issues also at an international scale, when you think of teleconnections and land swapping and land grabs, will also play out importantly when we talk about food security. It's no longer a local issue, but what food is being shipped where and what energy and water footprint does it come from, come with associated with it. And what does that mean to countries that are food secure but can't use their food because it's been bought up, you know, a lot of that land has been bought by other countries. That, that's, a, that's a great point, Harvey. Uh, and talk, talking about shocks, uh, uh, Stefan, uh, I think one, one of the shocks we are still experiencing is, is, is of course COVID-19. Right. It, it may not have uh, affected, well, it has affected food production, but I think more importantly, it has, it has, it has affected the supply chain. Right? Uh, and, and that's uh, being, being very acutely felt in, in countries like Singapore uh, that depend on uh, food imports for, for much of our, of, of our food consumption, our food supply. Um, and uh, so, so it's, it's, uh, it's an inter another interesting dimension uh, in, in the sense that in this case, in this kind of shocks, uh, uh, country have, countries have to also deal with uh, different ways of, of, uh, of ensuring that the, 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 the food supply chain continues to function and uh, the food gets to uh, the, the people who need them the most. Um, I have uh, another question, uh, and this is, this is uh, really for Professor uh, Magendra Harini. Um, so you, you talked a little bit about um, rural urban migration. So actually you, talk, uh, you focus quite a bit on rural urban migrations, and that's, that's very interesting. Um, you, you talk quite a bit on the uh, food and nutritional security of the migrants after they've uh, moved to the cities. Um, I wonder if you could also speak to the impacts of these migrations on food security for the wider society or wider community, given that now I assume um, these migrations must have resulted in the uh, abandonment of, of farmlands in the rural areas and, and resulting in compromises to agricultural productivity. Um, so do you have uh, any insights to share on how these migrations are also affecting the wider society? That's a very important question. Uh, we found 
contrary to some of our expectations that actually there has not been you know there was the theory as you're alluding to the idea that when you had large scale migration of this kind it would you would lead to it would lead to forest recovery and abandonment of farmlands in rural india but what you find is this migration is a largely seasonal so people still go back in uh, plantation cycles and b it's not the whole village that moves it's usually the women the children and the elders who stay back and it's the young men of a certain age group that move to the cities so the lands are still farmed maybe not at that productive level what actually happens is paradoxically that when you have this migration there's some money that goes back so that money is invested into a bore well or some other kinds of technology that keeps or you know maybe in seeds that keeps the agriculture going for longer but it also makes it more and more buy into this the cycle of high priced seeds uh, bore wells uh, electricity which often fails and so it they get essentially deeper into a cycle of commercial crops and these land crashes in this volatile price cycles so what it does is you don't get abandonment but it pushes them away from subsistence into a commercial which is not very viable for for land of that size and it does not lead to forest recoveries what at least we seem to be seeing in 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 our research in some parts of india oh that's that's super interesting um i i wonder if if it does anything uh in terms of poverty alleviation in the rural areas uh, do, do you have any thoughts on that so it seems to Or and it seems to be dependent on the income of the house so this is rural areas and poverty is sort of a relative term it depends on where you where you do the cut off the slightly better off villages don't have as much of a dependence on migration and they seem to be somewhat buffered but the poorer village the poorer households in the village which are migrating much more seem to be pushing themselves deeper into a debt and poverty trap because of this migration so it, it, yeah it, it's it's complex i think we're going to get the, the the flavor of what's happening in the next 10 years and covid of course has changed a lot of things thanks thanks for that uh sunna ganja um does anyone on the panel have questions for other panelists i, I don't want to uh well, dominate I mean, the discussion actually actually i do i think one one thing that was striking in the um in the presentation was the role of things which are not about calories but all of the nutrients and i think i guess there is also a question of the quality of what you eat but also i mean for the the taste and the pleasure of food but also the 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 nutrients uh, because calories are not are not everything so maybe a, a question for for david about about that aspect because we we tend to look at quantities produced in kilograms we use calories to aggregate uh can we can we what can we say about the uh vitamins and uh, and other aspects of uh, of good nutrition Yeah, I think there's two aspects to that. One is the the direct effects that climate changes are having on crops themselves and and there's actually been a lot of studies to show that that climate and the in particular the CO2 increases in the atmosphere can directly alter the composition of of crops often making them less nutritious. Um and so that is an important pathway for example if you're if your main source of iron or zinc which is an important micronutrient in many areas is um is through eating your staple crop and and the concentration then goes down but i think probably even a bigger pathway is related to these issues of food price increases because as prices go up you see people switch what they eat especially for you know the people at the poor end of the spectrum so they'll generally switch away from the more nutritious foods into the cheaper sources of calories and you know i think that is not something that has been kind of well modeled in terms of its effects eventually on on hunger and, and nutrition but i think it is a a potentially important pathway and it makes the types of things that um harini's talking about in terms of supplemental sources of nutrition that much more important i actually had a question as well and and i don't know if we want to move on but um no no please please go ahead david you know i think w- one of the we've been talking a lot and i particularly been talking a lot about the risks and the and the challenges and there there're definitely plenty of those but there is in some sense an opportunity given that there's a whole lot of interest in really monetizing carbon so that we can make you know progress on reducing emissions and in particular the region is is as i mentioned a lot of 
a lot of the deforestation is happening in the poorest parts and it's associated with development. And I wondered uh, if Stefan, if you have a perspective on kind of recent activities around trying to use carbon itself as a, as a tool for poverty reduction in, in terms of paying people to preserve uh, the, the ecosystems that they're living in. Because if yeah, you, no, for think... example, look, see it like the, you know, $100 a ton of carbon would translate to, you know, many hundreds of billions of dollars in the global, actually, you know, globally speaking in terms of deforestation emissions. So it's a big number. No, this, is a, this is a topic of, of with, with a lot of interests and also um, a long history of, of successes, but also of failures. Uh, so we have learned the, the, the hard way that the, the, the success is really in the, in the details to make sure that the benefits are really going to the, the people living there who we want to, uh, to, to benefit from that. And, and it's, uh, it's often difficult to put in place when you have very, uh, very weak land titles and that uh, when you have like a, a huge of, of resources uh, available, it's, it's not always the people you expected to benefit who benefit. But we have learned from a lot of the, 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 the experience uh, and the needs to build those systems very carefully through an engagement with communities to understand what's possible, how best to use the resources. And, and we have new programs and very recently, uh, these uh, this programs, for instance, in, in, um, in Madagascar or, or Mozambique, uh, I've signed this, these deals where some uh, high income countries are providing resources against emission reductions. And those resources um, are used to sustain the communities and to maintain the, the ecosystems. And, and now it's, it's much more complicated than just paying for carbon. It tends to be real development projects uh, because that, that's the only way to make sure the, uh, these resources is really contributing to the uh, improving the, the, the life of people. So it's, it's more difficult to put in place. It takes more time, but it's also much more efficient. And of course, we're all thinking about those nature-based solutions, trying to use nature to solve our problems. Think about carbon, but we can think about flood management, the mangroves to protect the coastlines and having a, a better way of, of uh, using those nature-based solutions and to have people making a living, a livelihood out of it. Uh, so a lot of, a lot of way forwards to make that more widespread in the world. But we, I think now we have good templates that we could scale up. Yeah, another uh, very good example, I think, which we which could be followed, and I agree with you completely, that uh, the titles become very important, is Nepal's experience. If you look at 20 years of community forestry in Nepal, especially along protected areas like the Chitwan National Park, they have done reforestation by villages, and the income derived is from tourism. So yes, you get food also in these forests, but also you get you know, supplemental income from tourism. And in fact, wildlife in some of those fringe areas at, at the park is much better in the community forest areas than the park itself. So you know, the park doesn't earn as much revenue as the communities earn from tourism outside. And it's also education because these youth are trained in biodiversity and can actually take people around. So it, it and as you say, the money has been put back into development projects. So these villages, which I've visited, you know, over 20 year periods, much better schools, much better libraries, much better roads and all the other facilities and also much more food secure. So I think, again, COVID has disrupted some of these, but these are places that one could really learn from in, try, in terms of trying to take paradigms from one place to elsewhere. Yeah, but it's a good example. It, 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 won't, it will never be only about carbon. And one of the risks is the best way of storing carbon, if, if you're in a, in a primary forest, might be to just shut down the forest and to plant fast growing trees instead. And this is yeah. clearly not what we want. So we, we have to be very careful that the incentive to only capture carbon doesn't lead to things which are not sustainable or like good development solutions for the communities involved. Exactly. Yeah, and, and uh, I, I think uh, uh, I think all, all, all of us are alluding to the fact that, uh, that there needs to be safeguards in place right, uh, when we think about uh, um, such nature-based solutions. Because uh, nature-based solutions are not always completely aligned with other priorities. Uh, there, there could be trade-offs, uh, and in fact, there will be trade-offs. Um, you know, in, in some cases, uh, reforestation uh, can compete with food production, with agriculture for, not just for land, but, but sometimes for, for water as well, depending on the, 
the species that, that we are uh, replanting or planting in, in those uh, restoration areas. So it's a very, very fascinating uh, topic uh, of discussion. Um, maybe we can entertain another question, one last question before we, we move on to the uh, next segment since uh, we still have a bit of time. Um, so, so nowadays we hear a lot about uh, green, green economic recovery. Uh, you know, we talk about how as the world uh, slowly emerges from COVID-19, uh, it's, it's an opportunity for us to uh, look towards a, a new model of, of business, uh, of, of, um, of, of producing food or of conserving our, our natural habitats and so on uh, to address some of uh, uh, the challenges. Um, so I'm just wondering if, if uh, each one of the panelists could share some of the insights on uh, both, both the opportunities that the, the lowest hanging fruits, as well as some of the pitfalls of, uh, of this green economic recovery that everyone's been talking about. Who goes first? Uh, maybe Stefan, maybe you, you can go first. Uh, yeah, no, so we, we have worked quite a lot on that at the beginning of the, of the pandemic when uh, governments were replacing uh, lost income with public spending. And this idea that this public spending could be used to do more than just replace income, but also help transform economies uh, and create benefits that would last beyond the, the crisis. And of course, the first examples that we had were around uh, landscape restoration and, and nature-based solution. Uh, we have examples of, of work to, to restore land, uh, to invest in watersheds or in forestry that can create jobs for people who had lost them, but also improve the environment in ways that will improve incomes and livelihoods for years and decades. Uh, so we were working quite a lot in identifying those opportunities for co-benefits between the short-term emergency need and the longer-term development path. Um, in infrastructure, it revealed extremely difficult because people want, needed the money quickly. So doing new infrastructure project takes one at least one or two years of preparation and so on so it's, it's very difficult to, to to support an economy in crisis with infrastructure spending uh, but at the same time we, we have had a lot of uh, a lot of success in those uh, uh, public work program where you try to offer jobs that are not only a transfer to people in needs but also you pay them to do jobs that have a benefit for the broader community and, and the environment Frankly, the picture is really mixed. If you look at the amount of money that has been spent, a lot has been in supporting what we have and not really in trying to be transformative. But it's, it's not easy to, to, um, to criticize because in a crisis like that, we have also to recognize it's very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to create the, the perfect package. So now we're taking another take as we exit this crisis uh, to try to, uh, to have this long-term vision uh, entering and we're engaging with many countries in trying to identify those, uh, those good opportunities. Um, I was just to conclude, always careful in talking about the opportunity because in, in, in such a, a dire situation, I think it's difficult to tell people that this is an opportunity, uh, but it's clearly never a good idea to look only at the short term without trying to look at what it does over the, the long term because that can be uh, a missed opportunity that people will regret in the future. So we're really trying for this long-term view in, in everything we're doing, including crisis management. Thanks, thanks for that, Stefan. Um, Harini, do you have anything to share Yes, about uh, so a long-standing, very successful program of the Indian government is the National, Urban, uh, National Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme. It gives you 100 days of wage labor. And that's been used very successfully, for instance, in the state where I am, Karnataka, to restore water bodies across the state, in, and especially during COVID times. So this 100 days has been increased to 140 days. And uh, with that restoration of water bodies, you're getting climate security, you're getting wetland restoration, you're improving agriculture, reversing urban, you know, rural to urban migration. There's so much potential for that. One of the things we have been working on, for instance, is village forests, which are mixed food forests, food fodder and shade. 
and uh, you know based on our research and other people's research some of this fund is going to go into restoring a lot of these village forests across the state so it's not just water bodies now but these food forests which with jackfruit and tamarind and those kinds of you know food trees can come back in so i think if you can get these kinds of ideas to scale up across the country another thing we are working on with economist colleagues and some states seem to be interested in this to have an analogous a uh, scheme for urban employment guarantee so if you did this in cities or small towns across india or across the global south let's say and these are places where you still have these places of nature you know uh, still there you know wetlands have not disappeared etc and you do restoration careful ecological restoration and as uh, stefan was saying multifunctional restoration you know it's ecological goals biodiversity not just climate but also that in those kinds of situations i think you would get a lot of you know the green economy jobs because you get these migrants what are you going to make them do instead of constructing apartments that nobody lives in for investment you can actually reconstruct a lot of these ecosystems so those kinds of schemes i think if they can be taken up given the success of the rural employment guarantee scheme we need something similar for the, like this in 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 smaller places smaller towns etc thanks thanks very much did it any Okay. Yeah, just just briefly, because I, I see a long list of uh, questions, but, you know, from a food security perspective, I think there have been lessons learned for sure in terms of safe, safety net provision and how to do that well, how not to do it well in some cases. But I think also just an appreciation for how relatively inexpensive it is to improve some of these social safety nets for the type of benefits they provide. And I can say that in the U.S., we've certainly seen that, you know, with, for example, universal school lunch. Um, has something that came in during the pandemic and seems like it's here, at least in California, for, for good now. Um, and then the other thing I think that has been a positive lesson learned is, is there's a lot of food security implications of, of air pollution. And I think, you know, in the midst of the shutdowns in various places, I think we've gotten a lot of evidence about just how important air pollution is, not only directly for human health, but for agriculture itself. And so that I think those lessons will continue to to be developed, but I think in the end, it'll it'll actually spur more understanding of the co-benefits of these of these developments. Thanks, thanks for. Thanks for. And, Stefan, you have something to say? Yeah, and no, maybe one one thing which we're also trying to, to to build upon now is this concept of one health, which is bringing health for the livestock and the humans together. Uh, we know that a lot of new diseases are coming from, from uh, the contact with, with animals, and also that uh, these diseases are also affecting food production. So with the discussion on the pandemics and health in the headline for months now, uh, the idea that we could have a much more holistic vision of, of health for human beings, but also the environment and also the, the livestock and the, and the connection with, with food security, I think is also an idea to, on which we can build as well as to uh, get back to this question of nutrition, the fact that there is food insecurity in the world, but there are also uh, epidemics of obesity and non-communicable disease that also needs to be treated. And, and you see all of the synergies here, overconsumption of beef, for instance, which is creating emissions, making people sick and more vulnerable to any disease that would be around. Uh, if we could capture those, those, those co-benefits and, and build on the momentum those questions have at the moment, I think the, the potential for, for benefits in terms of quality of life would be very, very large. Thanks, thanks, Stefan. I think we better move on to the audience Q&A segment. Uh, so the, the audience is uh, patiently waiting for us to answer their questions. So the, the most uh, popular question we have uh, in the Q&A box, uh, uh, I'll just read it out. While climate change does affect food supplies and security, the real underlying cause of food scarcity and insecurity in many parts of the world is inequitable income distribution. Would appreciate the views of panelists on this point. Uh, would it be more important to address the root cause of food security? Is it more a lack of international political will to do so? So who wants to take on this question? I think Stefan's probably the maybe the most equipped. So I'll give him some time to think of a good answer, and I'll I'll just jump in with a, a quick reaction because um, this is a this is a good question, a common question, and I you know I think it is the case that um, 
throughout history, we've had income inequality. We've had you know, systems designed at times to really reduce income inequality. Sometimes those worked out not so well in terms of overall you know, agricultural production and food security, but at other times we've had such drastic inequalities that that has also not worked out well. I think the, the point that maybe needs emphasizing for, for some people is that the, the ways you get to income equality or, or less income inequality, I, I, in my experience at least, really depends on the economy you're talking about. And in many really poor parts of the world, uh, one of the reasons that people like me focus so much on agricultural productivity is because that is the source of incomes for the poorest people. And so even if you weren't worried about that providing food or, or lowering food prices, it's a critically important source of, of reducing income inequality. Obviously in the United States or probably in, in Singapore for sure, it's not, it's not the case. It's more about uh, tax policies and other things. But in many of the, of the food insecure parts of the world, many of, much of sub-Saharan Africa, for example, Agricultural productivity is the surest way that we know how to, to generate, you know, poverty reduction. And so it is, um, it, it is absolutely important to deal with income inequality, but the ways you do that are, are sometimes um, different depending on where you are. Yeah, no, I think okay. I would, I would, I would, I would say, I would say the same thing. I'm, my presentation was all about the needs for this inclusive development and reduction of poverty to reduce this root cause, this vulnerability that then makes the environmental impact so damaging for, for people's prospects and, and quality of life. Um, and I, I agree with, with David that in, even in countries where agriculture is a small and declining share of GDP, uh, it's very often a major source of employment and a major source of income for, for very poor people. So, uh, the, the agricultural sector is really at the at the center of, of, of this question between between the consumer and access to food and the price of food, but also the income and having the right price so that you get people to make a living out of agriculture and at the same time, especially poor consumers can 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 access uh, the food they need and the, with the, the quality they need it's, uh, is really important. I think bringing equi equality equality is really important also if we think at the, about the impact of growing incomes on diets and food consumption. Because one thing that's, that's also happening is a convergence of diets toward diets very heavy on, on, on uh, animal proteins, which have very big uh, impacts on the, on the environment. So uh, this is a, a very complex issue. I think we all agree that going after the root cause of, of this vulnerability is really important. And at the same time, it won't replace acting on the root cause of climate change because right now poor people are the most affected because climate change is just beginning. Uh, but only reducing the vulnerability will not replace actions to stabilize climate change and prevent this, uh, this, uh, this change in climate to just continue increasing more and more until not only very poor people are affected, but everybody is. And, and, and this is going really fast. So very short answer, it's all of the above. And we have to look at the vulnerability and the root cause, but we also have to look at what's happening in the, in the price of food and the production of food. Thanks, thanks, Stefan. Uh, maybe we can move on to the second question. I think this is probably directed at uh, Harini. Uh, if cities were to promote food foraging, urban foraging, what are some policies that can be enacted to ensure the sustainability of the foraging system? Uh, example, ensuring that food plants are not harvested to decimation. It's a very important question. And I think a number of posters have asked this in different ways. Uh, I think there's just a lot of literature already existing on governance, governing the commons that we can use. Eleanor Ostrom's, for instance, fundamental work uh, to show that People, you, you need to have a defined set of people in charge of managing that patch. And there are a number of ways in which one could do this. For instance, in a park, there would be park authorities that would somehow monitor this foraging. Uh, in a, so a lot, lot of a, a few apartments, for instance, are beginning to do this in Bangalore, where you turn your, your manicured lawns into food forests and you can do foraging there. So there, there is not too much risk of over harvesting. If you had primary government schools or um, daycare centers, which were really 
are for the children of the migrant workers or the most uh, food insecure. And you plant trees of a certain kind. You know, drumstick is a great tree because it's supposed to be the superfood tree. And then the kids can get that in their midday meal because India has a midday meal scheme for school children for a very long time. But these go into that, you know. So I think there are things like this that could be done that to prevent this kind of over harvesting. But also, most importantly, I think when you get back to the idea of foraging, most of these are what we call weeds. So they're so resistant. In fact, the, the, the plucking and the burning and all of the other things that we think would destroy them makes them stronger and makes them grow much more, right? So I think it's a difference. They were always selected out. They were these weedy species that grew on their own anyway. So I think it's just a sort of shift in, in the way we think of these and the kinds of species we start to use. In fact, I think there would be other challenges that come in. For instance, if you grow more of these or you have this kind of rewilding, you get mosquitoes and then you get health challenges. So you need to think of, of, of a more multifunctional way to deal with this. And the challenges will not be really that these species will go away, but you will get other species like you know, snakes and mosquitoes. And that's more of a problem really in the city. Thanks, thanks, Harini. Um, okay, so third question, I think this is for David. Um, Thanks for the presentation. I have a question regarding the advance in technology on crop production. Is, uh, is this technology impact on production a general linear increasing trend in our recent history? And evenly across the world, would we expect to see the negative impacts of climate change outweigh the, uh, I guess, positive impact of technological advances in the future in some Southeast Asian countries? Okay, there, there are a couple of questions embedded in there. I, I think the question of whether things have been smooth or not smooth historically, it, it generally has been smooth if you look over very large, like if you look at the whole world and you look over very long time periods, it generally looks smooth at that scale. But in any, in any one place or for any say particular crop or particular product, you'll often see step changes where a new innovation is, is to, you know, either introduced um, or adopted from some other country or some policy is changed and you'll see a step change. But in the big picture, generally, um, there's, there's more or less a linear effect of technology. There's also more or less a linear effect of these climate trends, although again, in any particular year or for any particular place, you might see a, a, a kind of a shift. Um, in terms of whether the, the climate trends have been or will be enough to actually send us backwards, um, I don't think that that will be the case. I, I think, it, for example, I showed our study that showed that the productivity is already being hurt by climate change. So that was about a 50 year period where we looked and saw um, something like a 20% reduction. But over that period, that 20% reduction um, was equivalent to about seven years of technology growth. So it was still only on the order of maybe 10 or 15% of the effect of the overall technology improvement. So looking forward, I think, you know, we still have a lot of technologies on the horizon, a lot of things we know could improve productivity of agriculture and then things we don't know yet, but we expect, you know, as investments are made. Asia has been particularly good recently about investing in R&D around agriculture. And so, you know, I think we'll continue to bear the, the returns on those investments at a rate that outweigh climate change. But again, historically, you know, we're not just trying to deal with climate change. We're trying to deal with climate change and population growth and increased demand for all of these. And so, you know, the question really as Stefan was trying to, I think, model in, in his work was on balance, are we going to be moving forward or backwards? And certainly if, if we actually see climate change overtake technology, that, that would be a very bad sign because we're using technology, not just to deal with climate change, but to deal with all these other, other threats. And you know, we could, there's some other questions on the board, maybe we'll come to later about which particular technologies, but I think we can't really afford to rule any of them out because these challenges are so big. Thanks, thanks, David. Yeah, there are lots of excellent questions. I think we are running out of time. Maybe we'll just take uh, uh, one or two more. Um, the, the next question, if I may paraphrase it, uh, is about what, what strategies uh, will be most effective to ensure food security in the face of you know, extreme weather events like uh, flooding and typhoon in, in the Philippines? Yeah, so, I mean, this is, this is a very important uh, dimension that I, I, I don't think we have discussed or, or briefly the fact that it's not enough to produce the food. 
you have to, to move the food where it's consumed. And uh, today, especially in, 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 in lower and middle income countries, there is a lot of waste in that transport. A lot of the food is wasted because we, we can't transport it uh, into living uh, into the, the house of the people consuming it. And of course, disasters are creating uh, an additional shock on that. And, and we have evidence in the Philippines where some of the, 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 the stocks have been washed out by typhoons, but also where roads were cut off, uh, disturbing the, the transportation of, of food. Same thing in Latin America, where we have cases where the food production hasn't been affected at all. It's only the transportation into the cities that is affected and, and leads to increase in food prices in cities and, and, uh, and uh, hunger and, uh, and food insecurity. The response to that is, is really better infrastructure, more resilient infrastructure, uh, redundancy in our transport systems that you need not to rely on just one road and one bridge to, to, to bring the food. Um, and also emergency management uh, because bad things will always happen and we have to be prepared for those and have alternative ways of transporting uh, food when it's, uh, when it's needed. I want to add that the cases where it goes really bad tends to be cases where you have many things at once, and especially in places with, with conflict and violence, where you have conflict and violence disrupting the, 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 the food transport and food markets. And if you add like a, a drought or if you had, uh, if you add like a, a hurricane on that, then you get the very, very big impact because you have all of these reasons why the system is not, is not working. So it's all about preparing, investing in redundancy and resilience and having a very well emergency system that can cope with the situation in real time because we're always surprised by what's happening. Thanks, thanks Stefan. Um, I, think, I think we'll skip the next question on urban foraging and move to the uh, following one. Um, okay, how are we to simultaneously tackle food security and arrest deforestation globally in an equitable and effective way. Maybe David, since you talked about climate, food security and deforestation. Yeah, I mean, this question is really the crux of what a lot of us are trying to, uh, to work, you know, devote our careers to. I think in many cases, you, you just have to look very specifically at who are the people who are, you know, relying on deforestation as a means of, of getting out of poverty and what are the alternatives available? To them, and it may it may well still be, say, growing uh, oil palm, but it may be you can focus on intensifying within the existing oil palm plantations, and maybe providing payments for avoiding uh, communities that are setting fire to to forests to clear more land. So, I, you know that that would be a case, for example, in Indonesia. But you would maybe go somewhere else and understand in a very different way um, what what are the what are the alternatives to deforestation as a pathway out of poverty. Um, and then in terms of more broadly, the food security and deforestation, I think at the global scale, we just have to understand that high food prices are going to be an impediment both to food security and to, and to preserving land. As, as long as food prices are high, there's going to be incentives to clear land and there's going to be a, a, it's going to be very difficult for people at the low end of the distribution to, to afford food. So everything we can do to keep prices from rising high while preserving, you know, incomes for farmers is, is really important. And I think that comes down to just, you know, in real simple terms, getting better at growing food, understanding, you know, more of the genetic uh, opportunities with gene editing, understanding more about how to um, say use new fermentation technologies or, you know, some of the alternative proteins, all of these kind of ideas need to be on the table to help, I think, provide that sustenance without the, the big incentive to clear land. Also, if I can add, uh, I think a big part of this is what kinds of tenure rights people have over their land. So whenever you have com uh, common property rights over forests, it, it, despite land prices, despite insecurity, despite you know all kinds of other violence, you do find that uh, forest cover gets protected much more. And I think this is now robust across the world. So it's also a question really of how do we protect these? And unfortunately, 
forest land still tends to vest with the state rather than with communities in most parts of the world. So that's also something we need to fix. And that's, I, I think, also, also what you were saying, David, that all of this is so interconnected. You can't fix one piece without fix, fixing the others. Yeah, but that is a really critical point, I think, is that, that when you get down to it, the details uh, of who owns the land and who's making the decision is, is so variable from place to place and so important. Yeah, and just to, to add on this interconnectedness, one, one thing that's really striking is how every solution you can propose in each sector will not work if you don't have the full package. So if you do only intensification of agriculture, you create more incentive to deforest because agriculture is making more money. If you're doing only uh, banning deforestation without progress on agriculture, you will increase food prices and increase poverty and reduce opportunities for income for people. So you really have to work to work on those two legs that you have to just get better at producing food, protect the, uh, the, the, the forest and natural areas. And for all of that to sum up, I think you need diets to be, let's say, not too crazy, right? I mean, uh, it's, it's not like things are prohibited and so on, but, uh, but the, the more we have diets that are consuming lands because they are based on, on animal proteins, the, the, the more issues you have. So they, they, I think if you have two scenarios, one with diets which are lighter on animal protein and, 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 and more environmentally friendly, you can make a huge difference and make this balancing act between agriculture and protection of uh, natural areas much, much easier to achieve, which means that everybody has a role to play and we need all of the pieces of this puzzle to just work well together to, to, to achieve that goal, which is, I think, as David was saying, this is really the, the key, right? The climate, biodiversity, natural areas, and food security and, and, and good lives for everybody. Thanks, thanks Stefan. Um, I know we have run out of time, but uh, I have permission from the organizers to, uh, to, uh, to just uh, add on another five, maybe five minutes. Uh, I, I have a really uh, a good question that I am also interested in hearing the answer on, uh, maybe Harini is, is a good person to answer this. Uh, so what are your thoughts on the youth in regards to climate change? And, and what are some things that schools and education facilities can do to help tackle this issue? I think this is a really, this is the biggest question. If you see traction on climate change in the past 10 years in the public, let's say two years in the public imagination, it's because of youth movements and that's very clear. Uh, what can we do? I think we need to work with this entire education system, right? We're talking about nature-based solutions, if they're going to be local, if they're looking at actual action. Unfortunately, the kinds of education systems we have in place are leading them completely away from any connections to their land, their ecology, their, you know, what, what goes on around them in their environments. And this is across the globe. I think whichever country you go to, those education systems don't exist. So can we do something with those education systems that get them working on the land in some ways and doing things? And th that's really possible. I think it's also important because uh, at least in my 25, 30 years career as an educator, what I'm seeing is young people are much more aware. Yesterday, one of my students in her class told me that she's not, she's worried about whether she's, her generation is going to live the next 30 years. So they're dealing with existential challenges, but they're also very young. And it's very difficult at this age to be dealing with, with this kind of danger. So it, it's one of these very dismal areas, climate change, which can lead to a lot of mental health issues. And therefore, I also need, think we need to have action on sustainability, whether it's you know, something as simple as setting up composting or planting or something, because that action makes them feel positive. And again, we just we need to get this education. They need to be in the forefront, but not in a way that they're depressed and frightened out of their wits. And it is a scary time for them. We need to have a way that they can feel in control and take back their lives. So how do we make that kind of education possible is something I think we all as educators need to need to really think about. Thanks. Thanks so much, Irene. I, uh, I better move on to, uh, to the final uh, closing I, segment. Uh, oh, just I, I wanted to, to, say. To, to add to that, oh, that this is something that we see all the time now that we make the problem look so big that young people feel like it's it's a lost cause and if if we do that this is this is over right so I, I think it's really important in how we present those challenges to also present the different blocks that can solve it so that it looks like it's something that can be solved uh, otherwise all of this energy will go to waste because if you don't see a, a solution you just give up uh, 
So I think in the communication to, to, to young people, there's a lot of work to do to explain the challenges as well as we explain all of the solutions that we have. They might be difficult to implement, but they are there and, 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 and we'll make it. Uh, I think if we don't finish, but we'll, we will make it, then it gets very difficult for them to engage. Thanks, thanks, Stefan. Uh, here are my key takeaways. Uh, the first one is um, the climate change can lead to slowed agricultural productivity and growth, which in turn can lead to food insecurity. Uh, conversely, a rising agricultural demand can drive expansion, resulting in deforestation and in some cases, uh, uh, and, and which in turn can exacerbate climate change through land use change related carbon emissions. Thirdly, uh, COVID-19 uh, can have a uh, similar impact, magnitude of impacts on poverty as climate change, um, but there is opportunity to combine uh, COVID-19 recovery with uh, broader resilience gains. And, and finally, uh, many of these emerging challenges are interconnected and therefore there are opportunities to address uh, these multiple challenges at once, especially in cities where land is scarce. And uh, with that, I would like to bring this session to a close. Um, this has been a fantastic panel discussion and we really uh, have our fantastic panel of esteemed speakers to thank for it. So let me convey my appreciation to Professor David Lobel, Professor Harini Nagendra, and Dr. Stefan Haugat for sharing your valuable insights with us uh, today. Also, on behalf of the panelists today and the co-organizers of this webinar series, I sincerely thank you, the audience, for spending the last hour and a half with us today. And of course, uh, this also brings to close our four-part panel discussion series in the wake of a changing climate, which is jointly organized by the Head Foundation and the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions at the National University of Singapore. If you have had missed any of the previous uh, three webinars, uh, do know that the recording of all four webinars will be available on YouTube. The link will be available on the uh, Hate Foundation uh, and our center website. Uh, we will also be sending you the link uh, in our thank you email. And with that, I'd like to thank uh, everyone and uh, wish everyone uh, have a great rest of the day. Thank you.